Hey, you all, Farmer Jesse here. So, uh, if you've been watching our channel for a while, you know that what we do is kind of trial as many no-till systems as possible on our farm, so that I have some perspective on them for the podcast, for notillgrowers.com, uh, but also we don't just trial them. We don't just put them in a by four backyard garden and see how they do. We do all of our no-till system in a production model. So we're trying to see the viability of it. Um, and one thing I wanna talk about today is not just your average no-till system, it's kind of a hybrid of two no-till systems. So anyway, subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed, but otherwise, let's do it. So the primary no-till system that we use here at Rough Draft Farmstead is the deep mulch compost system. So this is a deep layer of compost um, that we plant into. It's a very simple system. You just layer compost really thickly and you plant into that. Some of the people that you may know of that use this system are uh, Charles Dowding. They call it No Dig. Uh, Richard Perkins is another one, did a great video recently on weed-free garden. His gardens are beautiful. Go check that out. Singing Frogs Farm is another one. All of those are great resources for this, and they've all notably been on the podcast. It's worth listening to each one of those episodes. And that is our main system. However, we've had a couple challenges with the deep compost mulch, the no-dig system, that I actually did a whole video about. You can watch that. I'll put that card up here. But they essentially come down to we get a lot of rainfall here we get very big rain events and we sometimes get several in a month uh, we had a 12-day period where we got over a foot of rain and it rained every single day and then sometimes we'll go you know a week or so without rain and then we'll get a three inch rain event it's feeling a little bit tropical these days in Kentucky but that's the reality of it so what happens is that we get some washout events so we're trying to correct that with some better path management Wood chips don't really work for us so much. They haven't worked in the situation that we've done them in uh, because they wash out. So it's kind of hard for us to keep the paths and the beds in place. So we're still working on how to manage that. There are other issues as well. Another one is the breakdown of our compost. And you'll see our compost, it's pretty mulchy. It's uh, pretty carbonaceous, if you will. Um, but the breakdown of our compost is still very fast. And I think this is primarily because our growing season is so long and we also average 83 and a half degrees from June, the start of June till the end of September. And that's Fahrenheit. If it were Celsius, I don't know that we'd be here. And with high humidity, I think that what I'm often seeing here is actually a really quick breakdown of the soil of the compost so much so that we have to replace it at least half of what we put up we're basically having to put nine barrows on a year to just replace the compost that we either lose through erosion or we lose through just general breakdown that's not entirely economical for us one more thing though is that it's also not super nutritious we don't our compost is more like a mulch it's not the compost that we can get locally we can get a lot of it, we're in horse country. However, it's not, it's very carbonaceous. It's not super nutritious. Um, it's just okay compost. And that's the best stuff we found locally so far. And we don't really have the means to make it ourselves yet. So in effect, we're having to add some sort of nitrogen source. So we've tried, we've trialed a bunch of different stuff. I'll do a video on this later, but we've trialed alfalfa meal and feather meal and fish meal and um, fish emulsions and all sorts of stuff to add nitrogen to the soil. But even still, there are some things I really love about this system. For one, we can get into our soil really early on. So it is worth it to us to get the compost down and then just start planting into it in March and April when everybody else is waiting for the soil to dry out so that they can work it. We're already planting and getting stuff covered and getting crops to market. So I really love that about this system. The, the beds, the weed management in the beds is almost nothing for the most part. Now, again, with the weed, with the microbial breakdown, I think that we end up getting more weeds than your average no digger, but we do have significantly fewer weeds in our beds than 
we ever have before, especially when we were back in a tillage system. There are reasons that we still want to use this in our system, but we feel like there, we want to correct some of those other elements, some of those other downsides with a little bit of a hybridization. So that's what I really want to talk about. We've started doing more and more cover crop additions. And in fact, I want this to be at least half of our system next year. And there's a lot of reasons we want to use cover crops. One, these are, this is a mixture of buckwheat and corn and beans and several other things. And what they do is the buckwheat's sort of a microbial gatherer, the beans, the legumes, any sort of legume you use is a nitrogen fixer. You have uh, grasses and brassicas that can kind of hold that nitrogen in place. Uh, some of them will do a little tillage for you, uh, uh, basically just work up the soil um, and make it ready for planting. You can also use some different cover crops as a mulch. So there's a lot of incentive to using it. And what we hope is that by incorporating more cover crops into our no-dig system, we'll, those roots will help hold it in place. They'll help fertilize the compost that may be kind of mediocre. We can use this a little bit as a mulch going forward, and it helps with the microbial diversity. And what we really like is not just the mulches, not just all those things, and not just the microbial benefit, but using something that's more affordable, generally speaking, than your average fertilizer because photosynthesis is your best fertilizer. You're taking carbon dioxide out of the air, turning it into liquid sugars and putting that into your soil and feeding all these microbes so that if you can clear this crop really quickly, and I'll go into crop termination maybe in another video, definitely in another video, you terminate the crop really quickly and then you get your next one in, that crop can take advantage of the microbes that are there because they're gonna wanna latch onto the new root systems. This is an example of this. We just terminated all this. We've got cover crop planted in these. It hasn't started coming up yet, but that's that's what those are. Those were lettuces. Um, so we have cover crops coming up in that. In fact, here's an example of having the cover crop interplanted into old lettuce. And so the lettuce that's now done has become a cover crop. But with this one, we mowed it, we mowed the cover crop, and then planted cucumbers just straight in, right? We have our flail mower dipped down as low as we can make it, put the, the cucumbers straight into the soil, and the only thing is, is we had to pick out a few weeds here or there, but it's pr in really good shape. That would be the same kind of plant and planting method we'd sort of do with these beds, is that in the springtime we'd have it in no-till, no-dig beds. Uh, we'd get those planted as quickly as possible. Then when that first crop comes out, we'd get a cover crop in there as fast as possible, mow it, and then plant stuff directly into that soil so that we're gathering some of those microbes in the middle of the season. Maybe that shade will help cool down and slow down the microbial breakdown of that compost. And then also just feed the next crop without us having to add something like feather meal or fish meal or whatever it may be. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in the ground for a super long time. This, if we wanted to, right, we had kale and stuff in here, we could have interplanted all this into the kale and then as soon as it got to a certain height, and we kind of terminate our kale around July, um, as soon as it got to a certain height, we could just terminate the kale or let the kale grow and then terminate it all together. Um, and then put in the next crop immediately following. So we're not necessarily pausing beds, but you can. I think it's a great pause for a bed, get better than tarps. Tarps, right, there's no photosynthesis going on here. So that's not super helpful for the next crop. Whereas this is, feeding the soil, getting it prepared for the next crop. That is the literal definition of cultivation. So, so anyway, that's just some, just some thoughts there on hybridizing a system. I think it's super important. One thing that we get, that kind of gets lost in the, in the conversation when we talk about agriculture and especially no-till agriculture is that your situation, your context is going to be different from anybody else's. It's great to have these sort of tools in your toolbox to be able to adjust your climate and your rainfall and your humidity and your temperatures and all those things to a system that fits you and fits your scale. Yeah, I mean, it's this, it's July is one of those funny months where I feel like this, where a lot of people may be covered in weeds or um, may just be discouraged. They're not getting the crop production they want. I, I discourage you from feeling bad about it. Don't. This is a great learning opportunity. And always remember that comparison is the thief of joy. Do not compare yourself to other farmers and have that make you feel bad about yourself. You'll get there.
but you have to find your system and you have to be willing to be adaptable and try a few different things occasionally. And this is one of those. So anyway, that's my random impromptu motivational speech. So anyway, subscribe to this channel if you're not subscribed. Uh, let me know your thoughts on this and any other sort of hybrid hybridization of a system that you've done or that you're interested in seeing. Always happy to try these out. We've tried so many different things and, I, and I'm, and I know there are so many more that we need to try. So otherwise it's kind of hot out here. I'll go do something somewhere cool. Remember 85 degrees, that's uh, Celsius. All right, thanks for watching. Bye you all. You can go behind the cloud.